Hey guys, it's Matt from Eastwood. We're here in Eastwood Garage doing another live tech session. Uh, obviously today we're doing some TIG welding. For anybody who hasn't watched one of these before, we want it to be as interactive as possible. So we want you guys to log on, chat, like, share, and uh, let me turn this off so you can hear me. And join the conversation. We have Randy that does a lot of the videos and lives as well over here. He is doing the uh, questions. So if you have any questions uh, as far as pricing or links or, or uh, technical questions, he's going to answer them for you. Uh, if you have any that you'd like me to answer for you live on the camera, uh, he's going to save some of those uh, and give them to us throughout the broadcast, and I will do my best to answer them. So today we are covering, uh, we get a lot of requests for this, so I tr we try and do it uh, periodically. Uh, TIG welding basics, for, we have a lot of people that are interested in buying a TIG welder for the first time, or maybe you have a TIG welder and you're struggling with uh, getting your skills up to par uh, or where you want it to be. So I like to give a crash course on TIG welding so you can learn the basics, how to lay a bead, and some of the things that I see beginners come across that uh, makes them have issues and can uh, cause them to sometimes give up. So I don't want to see that. So I'm going to start over here with the machine and then we'll kind of work our way into welding. And if you stick with us at the uh, little bit further on the broadcast, uh, we, have a, we have a lens set up for our camera. So Joe's going to get in real tight on my shoulder and he can actually zoom in. You'll be able to see uh, adding filler rod and actually TIG welding as we see under the helmet. So it's really, really helpful. So make sure you stick around for that if you're just tuning in. So this is the uh, Eastwood TIG 200 AC-DC machine. Uh, so this does um, both aluminum, steel, pretty much any metal you can throw at this machine can weld it. Uh, on the front of the machine, uh, this particular machine does do TIG welding. It also does stick welding. Uh, it has an extra port here that we've added that you can uh, also use a stick or arc welder so you don't need any gas. If you're in a bind that you need to use that, you can plug that in there and use it. So there is a, an extra switch on here for stick or TIG. Obviously, uh, we're doing TIG today, so I have it switched on that. AC-DC, uh, so we're just doing steel today since this is just a beginner's demo. We're just going to show you on steel. So I'm going to have it switched on the steel. If we do aluminum, we would switch it down. No, no other changes need to be made. Uh, and then on the front here, or above that, on the front here, we have the switch for how you actually initiate the arc. So the panel control is for the finger switch here. So this switch here on our machine, this is basically what I, I like to call just a tack welding switch. Um, but you can use it for anything, uh, any type of welding. But this is a fixed amperage switch. So when you have this on panel control, down here, um, and we have our power over here. Whatever you have this set at, just like when you use a, a, a MIG welder or an arc welder, whatever it's set at is what you get when you hit this switch. So this is good, I, like I said, I call it my tack welding switch because if I'm out of position or something that uh, I'm trying to, uh, I need to use my one hand to kind of hold something or steady it, I'll use just this finger switch and, uh, and I can tack weld something and then once it's kind of holding steady, I can switch it over and use the foot pedal. So I'm going to be showing you on the foot pedal today. Um, so we have, I referenced a little bit here, the power. That's our amperage that the machine is putting out uh, when we have the finger switch only. So if you want to change the power when we're using the pedal, on the actual pedal here, this is the pedal that comes with the machine, uh, you can adjust the amperage on the fly at the pedal so you don't have to get up walk all the way over the machine and adjust it if you're not quite where you want to be you can just do it right on the pedal so this is the pedal that comes with the machine uh, if you want to upgrade your pedal we do offer a rocker style pedal that you can find on the website uh, to upgrade your TIG machine it'll fit any of our TIG welders we have different pedals all the same style that have the correct plug for our different TIG welders if you want to upgrade so uh, we went over power Next to it, we're not going to get into it too much today uh, because this is a beginner uh, demo I'm doing here. This is what we have as a clearance effect. Uh, some machines you may, or, or terminology you may have heard, is AC balance control. So that's when you're welding on the AC side, you can actually change um, the, the wavelength of it. So that's the clearance effect. We're not going to get into that. When you're on the DC side, 
uh, this doesn't affect anything. So we do, we do get some people to have uh, misconceptions about that, but you don't use this dial when you're on the DC side on our machine. Uh, on the bottom here, we have pre and post flow. So when you're TIG welding, uh, it's good to have as much, within reason, as much gas as possible to help keep the weld clean. So the pre-flow, it's just like it sounds, it's gas that comes out before you initiate an arc. There's a couple of reasons this is good. It can clean out the torch in case there's anything that's in the end of the torch here. Uh, it also gives you a head start. So it gives you a little bit of shielding gas that's actually going to get over your metal uh, and your weld seam before you start welding. Before you even start an arc, you're putting a little bit of gas in that area to kind of give you a little clean bubble to work in. If you don't have that uh, pre-flow, you could have a little bit of uh, pitting or um, some contaminants that can get in the weld for that split second before you start uh, the shielding gas comes out. So that's why you need that. Uh, the dial I keep fairly low most times. Uh, I usually keep it around uh, two, just a little under 0.2 seconds. So it's a fraction of a second, not a full second. Um, if you're welding something, sometimes if I'm doing something that's aluminum or if I'm in a, a joint where I have uh, my stick out on my on my tungsten a little further, I may turn that up a little higher so that I get a little bit of extra time of shielding gas to get in that area and can uh, get in our weld area. Post flow, <clears throat> that is after we weld. So after we're done welding, um, we're holding the torch over our workpiece, you leave a little bit of gas flowing out of the actual torch over the area that you welded, and that's going to uh, keep the weld from getting any contaminants in it. This is especially important on stainless and aluminum. It's really important to get uh, that extra bit of gas at the end that's going to keep the weld from getting a contaminant in it. So on aluminum, sometimes uh, a surefire way to see on aluminum, if your uh, post flow is set too low, where you let your foot off, um, or you pulled your hand away from the weld too quick, took the shielding gas away, you'll see a pit right in the center of the weld. I uh, can sometimes even see a little bit of a crack. Uh, if you want to know more about aluminum, we've done a bunch of videos on that. I've done some intro to TIG welding aluminum videos uh, that you can catch on our YouTube channel. Username's Eastwood Co. If you're watching on uh, somewhere other than YouTube right now. Uh, if you search it up, you can see that we show using this machine on aluminum, and I go a lot more in depth. So, clearance effect. We did our pre and post flow. Uh, I keep the post flow right around three seconds. Again, if it calls for it, sometimes I will crank it up a little bit, but that's usually the happy zone that you don't have to mess with it too much. Um, so that's all our dials on the front. On the back here, uh, we have our shielding gas. For welding, uh, something we often, a question we often get is what type of gas to use. Uh, my blanket statement is 100% argon. Now there is some instances where you may need to use that, but that's uh, pretty far advanced. That's not something that uh, any of us in our home garage are probably going to run into needing anything but 100% argon when we're using our TIG welder. You cannot use your mix bottle that you are currently using with your MIG welder. Cannot use that. You're going to have problems with uh, your weld and it's going to be 100% the gas that you're using. So you got to get a new bottle, use 100% argon, uh, and keep it on your TIG welder. So that's gas, that's machine setup. Uh, I'm going to sit down and show you the torch. And then we're going to show you weld technique and get into doing a little bit of welding. So um, the weld torch, and I'll put this out on the, on the table here so we can get close-ups. Uh, so this is our weld torch. Again, I already covered the little finger switch here uh, that we're using uh, for, for doing fixed amperage. Uh, the, the torch that comes with our our welder is a WP-17. What that is is the style of torch and the size of the torch. So WP-17 is, is going to handle any amperage pretty much that this machine can throw at it. Um, if you need to do a higher amperage, you may need to get a, a larger torch. There is other torches out there on the, uh, in the world. Uh, there's water-cooled torches where the handle may be bigger, actually has water coming through it. This is uh, an air-cooled torch that the shielding gas actually helps to cool the torch. Um, and the size of this is a, a moderate size. So I wouldn't say it's a small torch, but it's definitely not something that uh, is a big, large industrial torch. Uh, we also offer a WP-9 torch, a mini torch, which is what I use a lot 
because um, I do a lot of sheet metal TIG welding these days. And the WP9 is really nice because it's probably about half the size of this torch. Uh, it's real light, small, you can, it's easy to, to maneuver around, that's great. Um, there's also flex head torches, if you go on our site and search for that, we have flex head torches where you can actually bend the head of this in different directions so you can get your hand in a comf comfortable position and you can move the torch around, the torch head to where you need it to be so you can weld uh, comfortably and get in tight areas. So that's the torch size. Uh, the actual torch makeup, we have our end cap here on the torch. And the end cap has a little O-ring on it. For any of you beginners, uh, keep it in your head as something that you just check every now and then when you're changing out a tungsten or electrode. Check this O-ring just periodically. Make sure it doesn't have any rips in it. Make sure that it hasn't pulled off, gone across the shop at some point. Uh, this O-ring is very crucial in keeping the shielding gas in the torch going in the direction you want, which is out over your workpiece. We don't want it leaking out the backside. So if this O-ring is missing, it can cause issues with uh, shielding gas loss and contaminants in, weld, in the weld. Um, so I'll pull this out in one shot. So this is our collet, <coughs> excuse me, and our electrode or the tungsten. Uh, so the, the collet has uh, little slits in it there on either side and when we tighten the back cap down this pushes into the collet body which we'll show you in a second and actually compresses it down grabs onto the onto the tungsten and keeps it in the position that we want with the with the uh, stick out of the tungsten that we want. The tungsten or the electrode um, over the years uh, technology has changed with TIG welders previously there was basically two types of tungsten that were most commonly used. 100% uh, tungsten, it was a green, and the red stripe that was used, uh, the, the green was used mainly for uh, aluminum welding, and then if you had to switch to steel or a ferrous metal, you would switch over to the red and use it for that. Uh, with the changes in welders these days, especially like ours that's an inverter welder, um, you can now, and technology and the actual electrodes, uh, they've now come out with electrodes uh, and welders that can basically use one type of tungsten electrode and you don't have to swap them out. So the, the one that we sell that I, that I use most commonly is this purple band. It's an E3 is a name for it. Uh, all of your electrodes or tungsten, tungsten are going to have a crazy uh, formula on it. It gives you all kinds of different type of uh, codes off the periodic table of what makes this up. I'm not going to pretend that I'm a scientist and remember what all of those are. Um, but I can tell you that the purple band is really good. It's going to work on any type of metal, so you don't have to swap it out or anything like that to weld different types of metal. It has a really stable arc, so if you do sharpen it to a point and you're doing, um, you need something where the arc's really tight and you have a sharper point on your electrode, it's not going to wander. At higher amperages, you can keep a tighter arc at higher amperages and it's not going to split the electrode or the tungsten like uh, would happen with uh, some of the other ones that were out there in the earlier days. So this is uh, an unground, well I'm sorry, an uncut electrode. This is the length they come minus I sharpen the end here. You can cut these down. There's different back caps so you can go shorter or longer depending on what you want. Uh, I like to run a shorter back cap a lot of times just because it makes the, the torch a little lighter, easy to maneuver, but it does mean you have to cut your tungsten down and run smaller pieces. So if you're a beginner, get used to grinding these because you're going to grind them often because you're going to probably dip them in the, uh, in the puddle and contaminate them and then you're going to have to start over and that's no fun. So on the front side here, we have our cup, our nozzle. Uh, that's actually just directing the gas to flow out of the torch in the direction that we want. Uh, the collet body here, you may look that you may uh, notice that the the holes in this it's kind of similar to a MIG welder as far as how the gas comes out. It's like not, there's holes around this. The gas comes out and then it's going to bounce off the walls of your nozzle and then eventually make its way out to the uh, the workpiece. Get your shielding gas over the weld. So that is uh, the collet body here. There are different sizes. The most common size uh, you'll see used is a 332nd and a 116th uh, tungsten or electrode. 
collet, collet and collet body. So these parts uh, do need to be interchanged depending on the size of tungsten that you're using. So keep that in mind. You need to keep extras of these on hand uh, for that. These parts don't really go bad. Uh, there's nothing to really go bad on these. So as long as you don't do anything catastrophic uh, that will probably damage your torch, these should last forever. So keep these uh, a couple extras of these on hand, but you don't need to keep buying them every time. So I'll put this all back together here. We'll show you how to set up the electrode on the tungsten, and then we'll get the welding. Do you have any questions as I'm putting this back together here? Um, have, have you ever been shocked uh, while TIG welding? So I had a good question. Have I ever been shocked when TIG welding? Um, I actually did a class, a beginner's class, at our, uh, here at our Pottstown store this past weekend, and that was a discussion somebody had brought up, so it's fresh in my mind. Um, I've been shocked a couple times, um, I would say lightly, all due to faults of my own, I would say. Uh, TIG welding, really the only reason you're going to get shocked is if you're doing something, you either forget or you do something incorrectly. Uh, one instance was I just simply had a ground cable. I was welding on a vehicle. Ground cable slipped off for me, hammering and dollying on the metal. Slipped off. I leaned on the panel to weld, and because I was closer to the ground than the area I was welding, I got a little zap. I was welding low amperage. It wasn't bad. I mean, you know it as soon as you hit the trigger, so I just let off. It's not like we're grabbing onto a, uh, a power line. Uh, the other time I've just felt tingling before. Uh, if I was welding and um, like, I, like on this table here we have the ground clamp. I have it just out of the way on the edge of the table. I have a nice clean uh, metal top on this welding table so I have no issues with it uh, you know, putting the, the current through this um, and getting the ground rather to pull through this. But I've had instances where it's in the middle of the summer I was welding a short sleeve shirt. I was sweating, leaning on the workbench and I could feel a little bit of tingling like I was going to get zapped. That's probably the only other time I've gotten close. And that was just, again, uh, I, I put a long sleeve shirt on, even though I was sweating, that helped me. Um, or I put my arms down on a piece of wood or something to, to keep me from getting zapped. But that wasn't even really zapped. That was just a, it was a warning signs. So you shouldn't have any issues with getting zapped as long as you've got your ground cable connected to something that's good um, and you're uh, you know, if you're, if you're hot out and you're sweating, uh, wear a long sleeve shirt, you know, or use something to, to keep you from getting zapped. That's it. Uh, one other question. Sure. Um, and maybe you're going to cover this later uh, about um, any suggestions on grinding the tungsten. Sure. So we had a question about suggestions on grinding the tungsten. Um, I was trying to, we're trying to keep this not super long, so I'm not going as in depth as if you take a, a class. But we do have some videos, if you haven't watched it before, I'm going to give you a short answer here, but if you have, we have some videos on actually showing grinding the tungsten uh, and how to do it uh, that, that are helpful. So search that up on our YouTube channel, you can find that. Uh, but grinding the tungsten, I'm going to try and get closer to you, Joe, just so you can see on this. Not too close, but... So this is one that I ground ahead of time. The one key is you want to be grinding the tungsten with the way that the wheel is spinning on whatever you're using to sand it, whether it's a, uh, a flap disc on a grinder, or it's a bench grinder with a stone wheel, or if you're using a, a belt sander. I like to use the, the belt sander, and I choose a section of the belt sander that I exclusively sand my, uh, my tungsten on. And the size of the um, taper on the tungsten, in the beginning, when you're just learning how to weld, the short answer is just basically put a sharp point on it and then put a little flat on the end. Um, if you change the degree of the taper in which you grind it, it does change the shape of your arc. But when you're starting out, um, I think it's hard to distinguish that with how much you're trying to figure out is going on. So um, what I do is, uh, is sharpen it almost to a point medium length taper and Joe's getting some close-ups so you can kind of see here and again if I'm grinding on a wheel I will grind maybe you guys can see back here uh, so I know I'm getting far away but the wheel on this spins this way 
So I will put my, my tungsten or my electrode in the direction it's spinning. I do not turn it sideways. So if you're using a, a bench grinder and you're standing in front of the bench grinder, like, we're, like if the bench grinder was here and I'm, sand, and I'm grinding, I do not turn it sideways to grind. I grind it in the direction that, uh, that the wheel is actually spinning so that with the scratches that we're putting in it are going in the direction that we want the current to go through and our arc to come out. So you can cause an unstable arc. So hopefully that cleared up that question. If you have a more specific one, exactly, uh, drop us a line and we can try and answer it a little better. We know exactly what you're looking to, to find out more about. Any That's others? it. That's it for right now. Okay, cool. So I'll continue on. If you have any questions, keep dropping us uh, comments or questions and we will do our best to answer them for you guys. So uh, now that we got this set up, the stick out of the torch, or I'm sorry, of the electro, this varies on what you're welding. Um, for my crash course, what I teach people is to let the electrode stick out just a, a little bit past where your grinding stops. Am I too far away, Joe? You're good? Okay. So uh, just a little further away from the cup than where the grinding starts. So you can see, I'm going to use a pointer here. Uh, you can see my grinding probably stops right about here-ish. And then I got this much that's sticking out past that. That's a good quick way if you're just a beginner and you want to know how to set this up, just set it up like that real quick. Just put it, put it even with the, where it stops grinding and then just inch it out just a tiny bit and tighten your back cap down. Do remember that this back cap, when you tighten it down, it actually kind of inches this uh, electrode out a little further as you tighten it. So if you have a bunch of threads loose here, we go to tighten it, it will kind of push this out just a little bit. So just keep an eye on it while you're tightening everything up. But you can put this electrode out further if need be, if you need to get in a tight corner or something like that. Um, or to get higher visibility, you can do that, but you do have to realize, especially with the stock set up like this, you're going to come into uh, gas coverage is issues. So you can switch to a gas lens setup, uh, which we have covered in some other videos. Again, I'm just trying to keep it concise here if I can. Um, or you can turn up the gas on your machine. So a little cheat or a little hack you can do is you can uh, bump up your gas flow just a little bit uh, to match the stick out that you did, you know. So if you st to stick this out a little further, just bump it up uh, a couple PSI and that'll help you cheat it a little bit to get the coverage that you need. But you can't go cranking it up too high or you're going to cause um, some issues with turbulence with the shielding gas in your arc. Um, the, which reminds me, I did jump over at the, the pressure or the uh, setting here. I'm going to try and turn this so you guys can see. On, on the gauges here, uh, you want to keep your pressure uh, on this gauge that comes with the with our machine, the standard stock gauge, uh, has a CF, CFH side and a pounds per minute side. A common mistake I see uh, with beginners is that they look in the book for what the settings are for setting the gas flow and they read the wrong side of the gauge. So you want to be using the inside CFH gauge, not the outside pounds per minute. So the, are almost, the CFH is almost double what the pounds per minute is. So uh, I like to set it anywhere, before I hit the pedal, I like to set it anywhere from 15 to 20 is what I keep it at, which is a little higher than necessary, but I like that extra peace of mind. That's CFH. So if you look, uh, this is a little under 20 right now. So if we read this gauge incorrectly, we we're on the pounds per minute side, and we were at 20. That's way up here, which is just a little over 40 CFH. That's crazy. That's way, way too much. No reason you should be using that much gas with just using a, a stock uh, nozzle on here. I, in fact, there's not too much of a reason to, to have your gas flow that high, except in some extreme situations possibly, but that's really, really high. I wouldn't be going that high. So you can usually hear it. If your gas sounds like, um, like you got a big air leak and an air hose, then you got a problem. 
your gas is probably too high. Uh, check it every time you go to use the welder. The reason I say that is all it takes is you bumping the knob, you know, to reach over or something like that. Or if you share a workspace, somebody's fiddling with it and it gets messed up and it could be too low or too high. So I, I make it um, pra practice for me every time I turn that machine on, I look at that gauge just to make sure uh, that something hasn't changed. So that's the gas flow. Uh, I'm going to turn this on and I'm going to sit down and then we're going we're gonna to do some welding. So again, make sure my gas is right. Flip that on. So our TIG 200 machine uh, works on, is self-sensing. It works on 110 or 220 voltage for the input, uh, which is really cool because you can, you know, we have it hooked to 220 today and, I, and we may be doing, I'm going to probably be well at like 140 amps approximately. Um, but if I needed to take this machine, go to a buddy's house, do some sheet metal work on his car and his little one car garage, it only has just the normal house outlets. We bring our adapter plug with, plug it in, plug it into the wall, and I'm welding all the same. I do that more times than I'd like to admit for buddies. Uh, I bring it over to the house and then we're using an extension cord and I'm welding some kind of low amperage sheet metal or something like that and it's not a problem, works just fine. You just have to realize that you can't crank the machine up to too high of an amperage or it's just gonna start popping the breaker in the shop that you're working in. So if you're doing some light, light duty stuff, you can use it on 110, you don't need to switch anything in the machine, just plug it in, plug it in the wall, it knows what's going on inside, the beauty of technology. So we're on 220 today because I'm doing a little bit higher uh, amperage of welding. So for your, how you hold the torch, um, I'm left-handed, so I'll start off with that, I oftentimes forget to mention that. I'm left-handed for how I hold my torch. So I like, I like to hold the torch in my strong hand, which is my left hand. Um, and I weld from left to right. If you're right-handed, a lot of times it's more comfortable to hold your torch in your right hand, your strong hand, and then you hold your filler rod in your less dominant hand, and that works best for you. Uh, don't be afraid if you're first learning to try switching it up and switch hands and see if it instantly feels more comfortable. I found that some people like holding the filler rod in their dominant hand uh, because that they, they have better control over the hand for actually feeding the filler rod. Whatever works best for you is most comfortable is the right answer. Just remember if you're holding the torch in your right hand, you're generally going to be welding from right to left. So that's the holding the torch. I hold the torch for most welding that, we're, that I do. Um, if you imagine like a pencil, I was holding, I was writing on something, I'd hold it like this and be writing. So if you imagine the torch, same thing, the straight area here, that's like your pencil. You hold it like that. Um, when, since we're not using, we're using the foot pedal, I use the little finger switch, it's just kind of like a, a grabber, it works for me. Um, if you never use the finger switch, it's just zip tied on here so you can pull it out, put it on your cart and you don't need to use it, but we're leaving it on today. So I will hold the torch like that, and when we're on our actual workpiece, so if we were welding on this here, uh, and the most ideal situation for getting the, the most direct weld into this piece, if we were welding straight up and down into it like this, that would be the best, if possible, uh, for getting a nice tight arc and controlled puddle uh, if we could do that, it would be great. But the problem is it's difficult to get your filler rod into here to actually add filler rod as you're moving. So what you want to do is turn your tungsten, uh, like say 15 degrees approximately, in the direction that you're traveling. So again, I'm left-handed. I'm going to be traveling left to right. So I'm going to twist like this. And what that does is it opens up my cup here and my uh, tungsten so I can get to it and I can get to the puddle and I could add my filler rod in front of it as I move. You do not want a beginner, something I see with beginners a lot, is they start laying their hand down because it's more comfortable or it's just bad habit you get into and you start laying it down. By doing that, you're opening the arc up, you're heating up a big, much larger area, a big area, and it's going to put more heat into the panel, it's going to make your weld bigger, and it's going to probably get out of control. If you're welding anything that's 
thin, or uh, if you have the amperage turned up enough, you can start burning holes in what you're welding. So kick it back, keep it at about 10, 15 degrees. That's a safe area, and you can move along and weld like that. Uh, a little trick on, our, on this torch here that I do pretty often, uh, if you don't have a flex head, which is a good purchase to have on the cart, but if you don't, this little head here is actually turnable. Not going to hurt anything, it turns in the handle. So if you're not comfortable at that 10 to 15 degrees, you can turn your torch. So if I'm comfortable right here, but it's straight up and down, turn the head my 10, 15 degrees, I'm ready to go. So don't be afraid to do that. No problem with that, it's going to weld the same. So we got that set up, our angle set up. A quick setup for when you're just learning for your height from the workpiece is if you take your filler rod that you're using, set it on your workpiece like this, and then set your electrode so it's basically touching it and pull it away. That's a good welding height for a quick setup. Again, I'm trying to give you guys a crash course. So this isn't the answer for everything you weld for the rest of your life. But if you're just trying to learn on a general weld, that's a quick way to set up. Throw this tongue, uh, the, the filler rod right underneath of it. That's going to give you a good height to work. What that does is uh, if you're too tight and you go to add the filler rod into it, and the additional filler rod may fill up the, the joint that you're welding, and if you're too close, it may touch the electrode, and you're going to either dip it or it's going to weld itself to your, to your puddle and then you got to stop and regrind it. So say, set this down, get your height, pull it away, lock your hand into that, that area, and then you know you're good to go, and you can drag your hand across. So that's a key is to try and lock your hand in a position or your arm to keep it as robotic as you can without moving it around. That's so you can get a nice, consistent weld. So that's the, uh, the torch hand. The filler rod, uh, Filler rod, the most common sizes that it comes in for most general fabrication is 1 16th or 3 30, 32nd. Uh, depending what you're doing as far as the thickness, the size of the gap you're trying to fill uh, will determine the filler rod that you use. So I'm using uh, 1 16th today. And to hold the filler rod, the way that I hold it is I balance, uh, I balance on my middle finger here, I put, I put the filler rod on that finger and kind of balance it there. I use my thumb to, gr thumb to grab it on the back side, and then I use my forefinger to kind of help push it. So you do it with these two fingers, you're kind of doing almost like a crab claw type effect. Just pushing it like that. And I'm using my thumb just to guide it. If we don't have our thumb on there, it's going to go all over the place. So I lock it into the corner, and I feed like that. It's good to practice, even if you're just sitting at home watching a football game. Sit and just with a piece of filler rod and sit and practice, feeding the filler rod. That's a big thing that I see uh, people that start to weld and they start to get the technique of moving an arc around, or moving a puddle, uh, initiating an arc, moving a puddle, but they're using a crutch or they're holding their filler rod like this. They're trying to weld. So they're holding their torch like this and their filler rod way out like that. And Filler rods bouncing all over the place. It's hard to control. You're going to end up touching, melting it together, saying a curse word, and having to regrind, which isn't good. So, choke up on the uh, on the filler rod, and just learn to feed the filler rod so that you you can move as you weld. Uh, as long as you're not welding something that's uh, really long, uh, you can cut these filler rods like I've done here. You can cut them in half. So this is an uncut piece. This piece I'm using, so I just roughly chop them in half just so I don't have that extra weight bouncing around. Now, if I was welding something where I knew I was going to be doing a long pass and I had to use this whole entire thing, then I would do it and I would just feed the filler rod. But we can't be holding our filler rod like this, like a piece of spaghetti. So, don't do that. Uh, any questions before I get into actually welding here? No. Um uh, no, we don't have any questions at this time. Cool. If you have questions about TIG welding, drop them in the comments. Uh, Randy or myself will ans we'll answer them. So cleaning the piece. Uh, good practice to get um, 
some stainless wire brushes uh, and keep them for just for TIG welding. Do not, I repeat, do not use your crappy wire brush that you use to clean grease off around your ball joint of your car. Do not. All you're going to do is put grease right into your workpiece and you're going to have a greasy mess that's never going to weld right unless you really clean the heck out of it. So keep some separate brushes, stainless preferably, and put them on your uh, welding cart. And I like to label them steel and aluminum so that I'm not interchanging them again, putting steel particles into my aluminum pieces. So we try as much as we can around here to label them for what they need to be used for. So we, got a, we have a large one and we have a little brush here marked for steel. So these, uh, these pieces that we're welding today are cold rolled steel. So versus this table here, I'll hold this, put it down. We got like a dark gray um, coloring to this table versus this piece, which is a lighter gray. That is the easiest way to tell the difference between hot rolled and cold rolled if you don't know anything at all is the color of the finish when you get it brand new. The hot rolled has a pickled um, coating on it that keeps it from corroding. Uh, and the process of actually making it at the mill is different as well, but we're not getting into that. Just I'm talking about the surface look of it. It has this coating on it. Um, which is very strong and is very difficult to TIG weld. Uh, by nature, it's a dirty coating um, that will, contaminants will come up when you try to weld it. So if you have something that's hot rolled, has this darker coating on it, you need to take it 100% off of the piece. So you want to actually grind it all the way off of the, off of the piece so you get a nice shiny metal before you start welding. If you try and weld it, you're going to have issues. It's going to pull contaminants and you're going to have a poor weld. So this is cold rolled that I'm using here, but it still has uh, an oil on it that's, that's on it from the mill to keep it from uh, corroding or flash rusting immediately. So we need to clean this off. Even though it's a brand new piece of metal, we need to clean this before we even start welding it. So first thing you can do is you can take a wire brush and you know what we'll do, uh, I'm going to do, I'm going to do a butt weld here because I've already got this beveled. So I'm going to hit this edge here. And I'm just getting any heavy, what I can get off real quick. Then what I like to do is I get some of these scuff pads. We sell them in packs of uh, three or four of them, red, green. Uh, either of them will work fine. I get one of these and I use our low VOC pre. So you can use the low VOC pre or you can use straight acetone if you have it. Do not use um, heavier cleaning chemicals like our, our normal pre, uh, brake clean, Holy crap, do not use brake clean. Uh, or any, any other heavy uh, cleaner like that carb cleaner, do not use those. They will create a gas when you go to weld that, that's uh, toxic, it's not good to breathe. So our low VOC uh, formula is safe to use, so is straight acetone. Uh, you can put that on and clean a panel. So what I'll do is I'll spray a bunch on my scuff pad here. Scuff the whole piece. Don't forget to get in the actual seam where you're welding. If we don't touch that area, that's not clean, and that's what we're trying to actually melt together. And you can get contaminants that'll pop up. Uh, depending on what you're doing, you may also want to hit the back side of your weld as well, because same thing, we don't want dirty contaminants popping up. So the one thing that I could say, keep in your head if you're just learning how to TIG weld, cleanliness is very, very important. So you want to keep this stuff as clean as you can. I know it's not fun. I'm as lazy as the next guy. 
I hate doing this, but you have to do it to get a nice clean weld. You gotta clean it, clean it, clean it. And the, ac the acetone or even our pre, it does dissolve pretty fast, so you may have to re-wet your scuff pad. All right, so I'll put these close to the camera so you can kind of see the difference in the, uh, in the pieces. So this is still flashing off. That's why it'll look a little spotty here. That'll, that'll go away once it flashes off and I'll wipe it down here in a second. So you can see the coloring difference. A little bit different, a little lighter of a, of a gray now. That's where we want to be uh, before we start welding. So if you want to go overboard, you can do the whole entire piece or you can just do a general area where it may get in into the weld. And while I'm talking, I'm just going to hit these one more time. All right. So I got my two pieces here set up. We're just doing a basic butt weld today. I have, uh, I put a small bevel on this so we have a little area so you can see how you add the filler into your bevel to fill it up. And gloves, make sure you're welding, wearing welding gloves. I like to have separate gloves for TIG welding versus MIG welding or ARC welding or gas welding. Um, these gloves, we do have them on our website. The TIG welding gloves are made of a different type of leather. It's much softer. It's a little thinner, uh, but it's much softer. It gives you more dexterity when you're welding, which is, uh, for TIG welding is very important. You want to be able to feed that filler rod, so you want to use gloves that have, give you some dexterity. So these are really handy to have. If you don't have uh, a thinner set of gloves, uh, I suggest you buy a set. It's a good investment. Your MIG welding gloves, especially uh, like arc welding gloves that are big heavy ones, they're, they're just going to be more uh, harm than good as far as technique goes because of uh, how, how thick they are. So you can find these on the site. If you search TIG gloves, they will pop up. So, oh, I think we're ready to weld. Why not? Oh. I brought this rusty crap piece of metal out just to show you guys. I know with your MIG welder, because I do it every now and then, you can weld this. This is a floor pan or something. It's got a little bit of surface rust on it. You might go ahead and try and weld this and everything's great or in, your, in our heads. Uh, don't try and do this with TIG. You're going to get an impure weld uh, that's going to pop on you. Depending how bad of the, ru the rust is, uh, it may start popping and crackling and acting funny. Uh, so you need to, if you have rust like this, do not try welding it. I mean, this is a piece I just grabbed out of the scrap bin, but I thought it was a good representation of something that's just been sitting around bare metal. Use the Scotch-Brite pad. Use our Contour SCT. Um, one of those, anything, to strip it, depending on how bad it is or how large the panel is, to strip off that, that rust um, before you start welding. So don't try and use the TIG on something like that. No good. All right, any other questions before we do some under helmet? Um, <clears throat> what would a dirty weld look like? Is that an easy explanation? Uh, we had a question of what a dirty weld would look like. A couple quick ways you can tell. Um, if you see pits in your weld, if you see little pinholes or pits, uh, if you see like a little like volcanic growth coming off of your weld. Um, I don't have, well, these are MIG welds. But if you see a little like volcanic growth that comes up out of it after you weld, this, something's going on there. You don't have enough gas or you possibly have uh, a dirty, you know, you have a dirty weld, but you have possibly something in your, in your panel or not enough gas flow. So you'll see pits. If you see a black halo, around your metal, uh, like heavy black, that's probably an issue too that you're burning off, that's burning off whatever the, the dirt is. It's probably going to be uh, a dirty weld. 
Uh, on aluminum, it's really easy to tell as well. You'll see little, little pieces of dirt actually in the, in the weld. You'll see little black spots in it um, that can cause that. But the biggest thing is if you see pitting in the weld, that's a quick way to tell it. You'll know it when you're welding because when you're TIG welding, it's really smooth, controlled. There's no popping, there's no sparks, nothing like that. So if you're seeing pop, hearing or seeing popping or sparks, not sparks, but like spatter, something's wrong. It's probably dirty. Uh, there's probably some kind of contaminant or you don't have enough gas flow. So that's a good question. I, I tried to do some on this, this sheet metal here, but it wasn't, it's not enough to be able to see it on camera. It's not as dramatic as I was hoping. So that's my best description. But you'll know it. If it's popping and carrying on when you're TIG welding, you got a problem. All right, I think you're good here. So I'm gonna do this, uh, this butt weld we're gonna show you under the, cam under the lens, what it looks like. Are uh, you getting on yeah. that side? Okay. okay. Another thing that I, I, this was just sitting here before we started, but it reminded me of uh, something that's really good to, that I do at home a lot. If you have a little LED flashlight, especially if it's a magnetic one like this, this one's super fancy because it's got the little clickers for angle. But if you're a beginner, uh, being able to visually see the weld is very, very, well, it's important any, no matter what, but like really being able to see what's going on is, is really important. So, um, or if your shop's dark, or maybe your eyesight just isn't as good as it used to be. Don't be afraid to set a little light and click it over your work area, directly over your weld. So you can really see what's going on there. Uh, once you're actually welding, doesn't make a difference. That just kind of does nothing. But when you're trying to set it up and your helmet's down, and you're trying to get your hands set up just right, it helps to have that so you can see a little bit better. Or if you just have a shop where the lighting's not very good, um, that's important to have that, just an extra thing. Uh, I like to throw the torch either over my shoulder like this, or I'll lay some extra hose in my lap like that. Uh, but I found over the shoulder, I like to just throw a little bit extra if I'm welding at the bench like this. What it does, you're not holding the whole weight of the hose on your hands while you're trying to weld. It's just an extra factor that can trip you up when you're starting. So I don't like to do that. Uh, let me just tack weld the ends of this together and then we'll start doing our weld. So I'm just gonna fusion weld these together. Okay. Now flip it around. Now what happens when you, when you tack weld this, you wanna trap it. So you wanna weld both ends of the piece. If it's something that's long, like you're doing a, a body panel, or if it's just something that's long and flat in general, uh, it's good to tack every uh, so far, every few inches or, or so uh, is good to do. This is something that's short, we don't need to do that, but what happened is when I welded this end, it wants to open up the other end. And if we just started welding from this end, by the time we're done, it's gonna, it's gonna open up the gap or it's gonna, it's gonna overlap the two of them if it's something that's thinner. So we wanna trap it so it can't move around. So that's why I'm tacking it. I'm gonna pull, push it back together here in one hand. And I just zap the two of them together, just use the heat to weld them together. So now we're ready to go. So I'm gonna go nice and slow. Usually if I was welding this, I would be moving a lot quicker than we're going to today. Uh, but I want you guys to, I wanna really let you guys see what's going on. So I'm gonna kinda over exaggerate the process. Are you me or am I? All right. So first thing you wanna do on steel, um, you wanna strike our arc. And I'm barely on the pedal here. Nothing wrong with just getting an arc started. See where you're at. See my filler rods just waiting outside, ready to start. You don't add filler rods till we get a puddle going. So I put a little more heat in it. You can see it's starting to get a puddle going. Now I'm gonna give a little more heat. Once I see it start opening up, I'm adding filler rod just to the front of the puddle there, not to the center, just to the front, and I'm moving 
dab and you'll know you're doing it right because it'll take just a little filler rod right off the end. You shouldn't have to shove it in. You shouldn't have an issue with the filler rod right getting stuck. It should just flow a little, little bit off the end. And we're filling that bevel up as I go. When we get to the end, we're going to back off the amperage just a little bit so we don't blow out the end. Add a little filler rod. Let off. Let the torch over the work area until the gas stops flowing. So if you're just starting out, uh, something I see people have problems with is they pull their hand away real quick. You're used to MIG welding or oxyacetylene welding um, where you just pull your hand off. It's no big deal. You just pull away. Uh, with TIG welding, you want to keep your hand there. So a good tip. Keep your helmet down and, and until you hear that gas stop. Keep your hand right where it's at, keep your helmet down. Then once you hear the gas stop, flip your helmet up, take your, your, uh, your torch away. That way you know it's a good practice to get into until you get used to it. So that was the, uh, I'm going to grab pliers here and we'll show you the weld. So, oh, we can use our fancy LED light here. Look at that. Ah. Ooh. Um, so, you can see the weld that I did. Lose Eat. What? Lose the light. <laughs> Not good for this. Uh, so <laughs> the, what, uh, you can see each little dab that I did. You can see the puddle moving. That's, the, that's you moving as you go. And then at the end here, we put a little extra dab on. So the well, the key thing is we filled up that bevel. It's nice and flat. So we don't have a big mountain of weld over top of the, uh, over top of the seam. Flip it. Flip it over here so we can see that we we're getting penetration through there. You see the heat affected zone. It's right here. So depending on what we were doing here, uh, I could have beveled it further to get 100% uh, penetration through here. Uh, you could have also beveled both sides, welded the opposite side, so we know we have 100% pen penetration. Depending on how structural it is, you, you, you make that decision. But I want you guys just to see that we're getting you know, the zone that's heating up. You can read your weld. If you see that the weld is bigger in one area, or the heat affected zone is bigger in one area than it is in another, that's how, how fast, a lot of times, is how fast you were moving. So in the beginning here, you can see a lot of heat in this. It's much wider than it is here. That's in that beginning section where I was just letting it heat up and I was talking you guys through initiating a puddle. And then as we moved along here, this is where we were into it and I started welding a little quicker and uh, it got thinner. Then here at the end, I sat a little bit, added that little dab of filler rod and then let off. That's why you have a little bit extra here at the end. Also, it's going to, uh, with the end, no material around here, it's going to heat soak a little bit more. So you can read your weld. Look at what's going on. You can actually see if there's anything in the weld, if there's any um, dirt. You can see where you bobbled. Don't be afraid to, to sit there and, and just read your weld. Um, let's get rid of this. And that'll help you identify your problems with what's going on. So that's my crash course in TIG welding for you guys today. Uh, do we have any other questions? <clears throat> no, we've, uh, uh, we've gone through all the questions. <laughs> but yesterday you asked if we were going live on the Camaro on Friday. Yes, yeah. We might either go live on the Camaro or maybe the Contour SCT. Oh, cool. So there's a chance if people want to see the Contour SCT, we might be doing that. If we're right outside this garage door Friday, if we're allowed to work outside the garage door, uh, we'll probably be, uh, okay. we might try to go live and show people that in action. Cool. So bit. we're... Uh, but I don't know what time of the day it'll be. Okay. It's going to be based on weather and if we can strip the, it's a, whatever, that 50 truck, if, if we can do that right outside the door and get all of our connections run, we'll probably do that. Cool. So uh, what he's talking about is we, uh, one of the guys here got a 50s uh, Chevy pickup project and he wants to strip it down so it's a good excuse to show you guys how well the SCT works so we're going to be filming it regardless uh, but if we can get every 
if everything shines just right, we're going to do a live for you guys to see it in action. Uh, or we may work on the Camaro, see, see what happens. So make sure you follow us on YouTube, on Facebook. Uh, turn your notifications on if you're on Facebook. You can click the little link uh, so that our stuff shows up first. Definitely do that. Then you'll get notified and you'll see our lives pop up for you and you can watch them. So uh, thanks everybody for watching. Uh, make sure you tune in again and uh, I'll catch you guys later.